وَأَقُولُوا فِي الْقُرْآنِ مَا جَاءَتْ بِهِ آيَاتُهُ فَهُوَ الْكَرِيمُ الْمُنْزَلُ وَأَقُولُوا قَالَ اللَّهُ جَلَّ جَلَالُهُ وَالْمُصْطَفَى الْهَادِي وَلَا أَتَأَوَّلُ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين I would like to begin after praising Allah and after asking Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam I would like to begin by welcoming all of you to this online Dawra Ilmiya, this online short course or this online intensive course which is going to last insha'Allah ta'ala two weeks brought to you by Al Madrasatul Umariya. And this is being broadcast live. So insha'Allah ta'ala we will be taking interaction from the students as much as possible. And insha'Allah ta'ala we are going to begin with the first of four books. Now I'm going to be taking you through two of them by the permission of Allah and Stad Abdurrahman Hassan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he is going to be taking you through two further books, insha'Allah Ta'ala. So mine will last for the first week. It is every day and it is at this exact time. So uh, in terms of UK time, that is 5.30 until 8 o'clock. If you are joining us elsewhere, for example, from Dubai, then we are, I guess, uh, half past eight until 11 o'clock if it is Dubai time. And that's every day for the next two weeks. Uh, as for the first week, I'll be with you and we will be dividing our week into two books that we're going to finish beginning to end, inshallah. The first is Al Wasiyyatu Sughara, the, which we, I mean, we'll talk about the meaning of it in a moment, inshallah. Al Wasiyyatu Sughara by Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala. And the second book that we're going to be covering is Kashf al-Shubahat by Shaykh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Rahim Allah al may Allah have mercy on them all. Inshallah ta'ala, the format of this, uh, Al-Wasiyyat al-Sughra should last us three days and Kashf al-Shubahat should be four days, although we may need to adjust half a day, give or take. And inshallah ta'ala, there will be someone who is reading the text both in Arabic and in English so that it is easy, inshallah, for you to follow along. Bearing in mind the time we have, we're going to try to cover as much as we can. I'm probably not going to go into a huge amount of detail uh, so that we can actually finish the book, but we will still try to bring as many points and as many benefits uh, as possible. So with that being said, I would like to start straight away and dive straight into this. The only other thing I will mention is that because we're all in different parts of the world and this is an online uh, intensive dawrah uh, where inshallah ta'ala we'll be covering these books because we're all online in different places in the world there's no doubt that prayer times are going to be different in different places in some places like Dubai it may be the case that you don't have a prayer time that comes in the way of the class it may be for some of you in the UK for example where I am Asr time started and we prayed Asr but in many masajid, the jama'ah hasn't gone for asr yet. Yeah, people are still going to gather together, maybe 6 o'clock UK time for asr. So what I'm going to say is this. At the end of the day, this course, we love for you to attend and to be with us and concentrating on it. But ultimately, the very benefit of this course, especially in this first book that we're talking about, كنت, have taqwa of Allah wherever you are. Ultimately, you know, you, the prayer is what is the most important thing. So if it is the case that you are within easy reach of the masjid and the time for the salah comes, my honest advice is that you pause the video, you go, you pray in the jama'ah and you come back and then you start the video again and inshallah ta'ala or you forward it up to where we are and you catch up on that 10 or 15 minutes that you missed out on because this is the case with online lectures and seminars that people in different places in the world it's not really possible for us to stop at a particular time because if I stop at a particular time, which is my Asr time, then, you know, half an hour later, it's somebody else's Asr time. 
and half an hour later it comes to somebody's maghrib time and it comes to and so on and so what we're going to say is this personally take care of it yourself if the time for the salah comes and you are within easy reach of the masjid then uh, go to the masjid pause the video resume it or catch up on that little bit later on if it's the case that you are far away from the masjid then at least make that effort to pray in the jama'ah uh, and, and don't worry if that means that you miss 10 or 15 minutes of the class ultimately you can catch up on it and at the end of the day we are learning this knowledge in order to act upon it and to get near to Allah not in order for us to make for it to make us more distant or more or further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this book before we start reading the text is entitled al wasiyatu sughara al wasiyatu sughara this word wasiyah really the word wasiyah we often translate it as an advice but really it could be as equally or equally it could be called a commandment because the essence of a wasiyah is al amru aw an nahi aw huma ma'an it is either a command or a prohibition or both of them together in that which the person giving this commandment or this advice believes will benefit others or the person it's being given to so it is a commandment or a series of commandments or a prohibition or a series of prohibitions or a combination of the two with the goal of benefiting the person who receives that commandment so when we translate it as an advice we're probably not picking the most accurate word for it to, to call it an advice there are probably it's difficult it's between a commandment and an advice it has that essence of advice because typically uh, the wasiyah or not always as we're going to hear in terms of the wasiyah in the Quran but many times a wasiyah is something requested uh, Ya Rasulullah awsini O Messenger of Allah give me a wasiyah give me a wasiyah I give me an advice a commanding advice an advice made up of commandments and prohibitions and in that sense it has the aspect of an advice to it Likewise, on the other side, it's not something which is voluntary, particularly when it's coming from Allah and from the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم. It's not for a believing man or a believing woman if Allah and His Messenger decree something that you should have any decision in the matter at all any choice there's no choice when it comes to Allah and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so in that sense when we talk about the wasiyah of Allah it's not something that Allah azza wa jal is giving you as an advice in the sense that take it or leave it you know this is what I advise you rather it is a commandment from Allah and a commandment from the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advising you as to what will benefit you and this idea of a wasiya, this is the title of the book, Al Wasiyah to Sughara, and we're going to talk about some other titles of the book as well. This idea of the wasiya, I just wanted to talk about really to begin with, just in terms of the title, Al Wasiyah. So we said it's a, a, an advice made up of commandments and prohibitions in order to benefit the person who's been given that advice. And I just wanted to talk very, very briefly about why it's so important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wal asr, in al insana la fi khusr, illa al ladina aman wa amilu salihat, wa tawasaw bil haq, wa tawasaw bil sabr. By time, Allah subhanahu swore by time, and Allah subhanahu only swears by that which is mu'avvam, it's very great and very significant in His sight. So Allah swore by time. And Allah swore by time and then He told us the default condition of mankind. Innal insana lafi khusr. Mankind is in a state of loss. In other words, if mankind doesn't take advantage of this time 
which is so great and so significant in Allah's sight, if mankind doesn't take advantage of this time through the things that Allah mentioned, then they are fil khusr. They are fi khusr in a state of loss. What will take you out of that loss and allow you to benefit your time is if your time is filled with these things. Allah mentioned Al Iman, and Al Iman is made up of knowledge and beneficial actions. It's made up of knowledge and beneficial actions. And that's why Allah mentioned الصالحات, So Allah mentioned Iman, and what is intended here is particularly to emphasize knowledge followed by al amal al-salih which is a part of your iman righteous actions and then at tawasi and at tawasi is giving each other wasiyah that's what the word watawaso giving each other wasiyah i give you wasiyah and you give me wasiyah we each give each other advice which contains commandments it's not like you know, I advise you to think about your future. I, I advise you, ittaqullah, have taqwa of Allah. So this is an, a powerful advice containing commands and prohibitions. What is that advice based upon? It is based upon al-haqq, it's based upon the truth. It's not an advice that is falsehood. And the truth is what comes from Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَمَاذَا بَعْدِ الْحَقِّ إِلَّا الضَّلَالِ What is after the truth except for? Misguidance and the tawasi, the mutual giving of this advice and these commandments and commanding one another and advising one another and prohibiting one another. And part of that commandment encompassing patience as a result of what happens to you when you do all of those things that you are required to do. When you have beneficial knowledge and righteous action and you propagate that knowledge and action through da'wah, then you remain patient upon what happens to you as a result of that. This surah alone is enough for us to understand ahamiyatul wasiyya, the importance of the wasiyya, the importance and how important it is that this, uh, these advices or these proclamations or these, uh, these commandments and this uh, propagating the religion, how important this is. From this also we can mention the hadith in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Tamim ibn Awsin al-Dari, radiyallahu an, in which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, ad-deenu nasiha this religion is a nasiha And a nasiha sometimes people translate it as giving sincere advice. Maybe I would say in this hadith, the more general translation would be to say the religion is acting sincerely towards others. Ad-deen al-nasiha, acting sincerely towards others. Qalu liman ya Rasulullah. They said, to whom should we be acting sincerely towards, O Messenger of Allah? Qala lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi. He said, to whom, O Messenger of Allah? He said, to Allah and to his book and to his messenger and to the leaders of the Muslims and to the general folk, the general people, the general Muslims. This hadith also is enough for us to understand the value of giving advice to others and acting sincerely to others. So if we want to reword this, we can say the wasiyah is a series of commands and prohibitions for the purpose of, for the purpose of sincerity towards the one that the wasiyah is being given to. I acting sincerely towards, we can say like that, that it is a series of commands and prohibitions acting in sincerity towards which are intended sincerely, that's a better way of saying it, intended sincerely for the one to receive them, who receives them. A series of commands and prohibitions intended sincerely for the one who receives them. This religion 
the Prophet Ad-Din, this whole religion is an nasiha is this sincere action. And among this sincere action and at the forefront of this sincere action is at-tawasi bil haqq and at-tawasi bil sabr, at giving each other wasiya, giving each other wasaya, as the plural is, giving each other advice which is given sincerely, commands and prohibitions intended sincerely for the person that they are being given to. So this text that we're going to cover today is a wasiyah. And it's entitled Al Wasiyah to Sughara, the small wasiyah. Now it's not called small because the topic is small. In fact, this wasiyah is wasiyatun azimah. It is a huge, huge, vast, and incredibly beneficial wasiyah. So it's not called sughara because it's not valuable or because it's not important or because only tiny. But it's called sughara for two reasons. First of all, because the number of pages is very few. Uh, different prints we have run between 11 and 13 pages or so. Uh, it's a very, very small, few number of pages. So in that sense, it is sughara. It's small in size. Secondly, the author, who is Abu al-Abbas, Ahmed, Ibn Abd al-Halim, Ibn Abd al-Salam, Ibn Taymiyyah, al-Harrani, Rahimahullah ta'ala, and he died 728 after the Hijrah. The author, Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahullah ta'ala, he has another wasiyah. And this wasiyah that he has is al wasiyah al-Kubara, it's known by. al wasiyah al-Kubara. The large wasiyah or the greater wasiyah. The lesser wasiyah, the smaller one, and the bigger one. And this bigger one, it runs to around about 70 pages or so. And interestingly, it, the, the, it, this is probably a good point for us to talk about the title. This title, Al Wasiyah to Sughara, is actually not the original title that this work was known by. This work among the early people was known as Wasiyah to Shaykh al Islam ila Abil Qasim al Sibti. It was known as the advice of Shaykh al Islam to Abil Qasim al Sibti, who is the person who we're going to hear, inshallah ta'ala, as we start the text, is the person who was the cause for this book to be written. It was always known as Shaykh al Islam's advice to Abil Qasim al Sibti. That's what it was known by. However, later on, when the collect the works were collected in Majmu' al Fatawa, and this can be found in the Majmu' al Fatawa of Shaykh Islam al Taymiyyah uh, in the 10th volume, uh, around page 653, something like that. And the larger wasiyah can be found also in Majmu' al Fatawa in the third volume between page 363 to 430 or so. So it's around about 70 pages, the larger one, and this one is around about a seventh or a sixth of the size at around about 11 to 13 pages or so. So for that reason, later on, when they became collected in Majmu' al-Fatawa, they became known as al wasiyah al-Sughra and al wasiyah al-Kubra, the smaller advice and the larger advice. This larger advice, for those who are interested, is incredibly beneficial. It was written to the followers of Adi ibn Musafir, and Adi ibn Musafir was a person that was a very famous, you know, subhanAllah, we, we imagine that famous du'at, you know, famous uh, da'iya, people who give da'wah and they're really famous and they have a lot of followers and, you know, they have YouTube channels and they are really, you know, well known. We think this is a new phenomenon. This wasn't a new phenomenon. This phenomenon existed even in the time of Shaykh al-Islam, but without the YouTube channels, of course. And this is with regard to a scholar who was known as Adib ibn Musafir. And Adib ibn Musafir, uh, he was, rahimahullah ta'ala, Shaykh al-Islam praised him and said he had lisan al sidq and he had, uh, uh, his, his words were beneficial to others and he spoke truthful words that affected the hearts of the people. But what happened is that his followers began to exaggerate over him and they started to fall into different types of some of his followers, not all of them. 
uh, because he was very powerful and he had a great effect on many people and his words were carried far and wide and it really touched people's hearts, it caused people to exaggerate with regard to him. So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he wrote an advice to the followers of Adi ibn Musafir and this is known as al wasiyatul al-Kubara. As for this wasiyah that we have in front of us today, this wasiyah is the wasiyah that was in response to a question which was put forward by Abil Qasim al-Sibti and we're going to hear about that as we start the book. It is interesting to say that almost all, if not all of the books of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah were written, rahimahullah ta'ala, were written in response to a question. And it's narrated from him that he said, مَا كَتَبْتُ كِتَابًا إِلَّا بِنَاءً عَلَى سُؤَالٍ Or he said, إِلَّا بِنَاءً عَلَى طَلَبٍ I was never, I never wrote a book unless I was first asked a question or requested to write it. Either someone asked a question or they requested. They came to the Sheikh and said that Sheikh, write for us about this. And this is a theme of all of the books of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala or the majority of uh, those books of Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, and this is no different. Uh, side point, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, as we said, his kunya is Abu al-Abbas, his name is Ahmed, Ibn Abdul Halim, Ibn Abdul Salam, Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, he is sometimes known as Ibn Taymiyyah, the grandson, to not confuse him with Al-Majd Ibn Taymiyyah, who was known as Ibn Taymiyyah, the grandfather. Uh, both of them, of course, from the same family, the grandfather and the grandson. And so Ibn Taymiyyah, who is Abu al-Abbas, Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim ibn Abdul Salam, is often known as Ibn Taymiyyah, the grandson. He is Al-Harrani. Uh, Harran is a city or a town which, is a, which was originally on the very edge of Syria, near to Turkey not far from uh, Raqqa, between, uh, near between Syria and Turkey. Right now it has actually become part of Turkey, it's been uh, taken over by Turkey, it's become part of Turkey, but it, it exists on that border region, on the very edge of Syria. And that's where Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, his family came from, and as for he himself, he, uh, I believe it was his father who left and he grew up uh, and indeed was known in Damascus, and this book was heard from him in Damascus, in Damascus, in Syria. So with that, I think that we can start uh, the reading, insha'Allah ta'ala. We'll just start with the first uh, paragraph or so. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. سؤال أبي القاسم بن يوسف بن محمد التجيبي السبتي المغربي. Okay, here a tujibi. I think it should be with a dhamma, a tujibi, and it's definitely a sibti. Okay, a tujibi, a sibti, and we'll stop there anyway because we have something to discuss about this. سؤال أبي القاسم. So if you want to read for me the English for that one. The question. Abul Qasim ibn Yusuf bin Muhammad al-Tujibi al-Sibti al-Maghribi. Al-Maghribi or al-Mughrabi? Both, I've heard both. Uh, when I heard this was, uh, when it was explained by Shaykh Abdul Razak al-Badr, he read it al-Mughrabi. And uh, I've also seen it written as Al-Maghribi. In any case, he came from Bilad Al-Maghrib. So let's talk about this question. Who did this question come from? This question came from a scholar who was known as Abu Al-Qasim and his name was Al-Qasim. Okay, so he was known as Abu Al-Qasim and his name was Al-Qasim. It's one of those people and there is a list of people you can remember them that their kunya is the same as their name. In other words, his name is Al-Qasim and his kunya is Abu Al-Qasim. Abu Al-Qasim, Al-Qasim ibn Yusuf ibn Muhammad at tujibi or Ibn Ali at tujibi and after Muhammad ibn Ali, 
التجيبي السبتي المغربي ولا المغربي He came from a city called Sibta. He came from a city called Sibta. Uh, he's mentioned, he has a biography. Uh, his biography was mentioned in Mu'jam al-Muhaddithin and Mu'jam al-Shuyukh by al-Dhahabi. It was mentioned in uh, the, uh, by al-Hafidh ibn Hajar uh, in al-Durar. Uh, and it was also mentioned by Al-Safadi in Al-Wafi. And one of the things that is mentioned about Abu Al-Qasim Al-Sibti is that he, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, was Rahalun. He was a traveler. He traveled all over the world. As, and he came from Sibta. And Sibta is a town which is itself very, it's in Morocco, in Al-Maghrib. And it's very, very close to Spain. In fact, from Sibta, you can see uh, Jebel Tariq. You can see Gibraltar. And you can see, uh, you know, that the, the Gibraltar and towards the Spanish uh, mainland. So it was in this location, in the most western part of the Muslim empire. Sibta, that this person, uh, the Sheikh Abu Al Qasim Al Qasim uh, Ibn Yusuf Al Sibti came from. And as we said, he was Rahalun fi Talib al Ilm. He was known for his traveling, traveling for knowledge. And this traveling that he did, he traveled a great deal. He gathered together in a book all of the benefits that he had from, these, from his travels uh, and the things, that, the narrations he heard uh, and the, the benefits that he took. And he called it Barnamij Barnamij Tujibi. Barnamij at Tujibi. And it contains the benefits that he took from his different uh, travels and the people that he met. And this is going to be important later. Uh, he actually, in this book, mentions his meeting of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And he asks Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, he says, وَإِنْ يُفَهِّمُنَا وَإِنْ يُفَهِّمَنَا مَا فِيهِ That Allah Azza wa Jal gives us the knowledge of what is found within this book. وَيُرْشِدَنَا لِلْعَمَلِ And Allah gives us the guidance to be able to act upon it. And really that should be our dua. We should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the knowledge and understanding of what is in this text and to give us the ability to act upon it. And really that's where, that's what the benefit is. That's where a person benefits. And this itself you're going to see is a theme of the wasiyah of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, Shaykh al-Islam, uh, that he repeats time and time again. And that is the importance of understanding and acting upon what you know, understanding and acting upon what you know. So it had this this meeting and this advice had a profound effect upon uh, Abul Qasim as Sibti. Uh, it had a very very big effect upon him uh, that he he uh, mentions within his Barnamij, within his book where he gathered together the uh, the, the different benefits that he took from his travels. So. That is something about the person who asked the question. Uh, he's also known as Al Najjar, Al Sibti, Al Mughrabi, Al Najjar, or Al Maghribi, Al Najjar. Continue. Yatafadal Sayyiduna Sheikh Al Faqih Al Imam, Al Fadil Al Alim, Baqiyat Al Salaf, Wakudwat Al Khalaf, Al Mubdi Al Mughrib, Al Mu'rib Al Mufsih. أعلم من لقيت ببلاد المشرق والمغرب تقي الدين أبو العباس أحمد بن تيمية أبقى الله بركته. Okay, in the English. 
I requested, I requested our, our leader, leader, the Sheikh, Faqih, Imam, respected scholar, scholar vanguard, vanguard of the predecessors, predecessors leader of the later generations, generations reviver of the deen, expresser, expresser of rare and wonderful, and wonderful ideas, ideas with great, great eloquence and literacy, and literacy the, most the most knowledgeable person I met in the lands of the East and West, Taqiyuddin Abu al-Abbas Ahmad ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah enable us to continue benefiting from him. So you'll see the translation might be missing a few words or have a few different words. This is from the differences of the min ikhtilaf and nusakh from the differences of the, the, the different manuscripts. But it's very, very close and it's very, very well written, the translation. And it's very close to the, what we have in terms of the Arabic here. There might be one or two differences. But what I want you to take from this introduction, and I think this is extremely important, is first of all, how this question remained and benefited people throughout the history and throughout time. And I think honestly that is something which is extremely, extremely valuable. That a person realizes just how a question, a beneficial question, can remain, subhanAllah, for hundreds and hundreds of years and people are benefiting from it. People tend to think about benefits in terms of the answer given by the Sheikh. But this answer given by Sheikh al Islam, we hope that the questioner, Abu al Qasim al Sibti, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, wa Rahimahullah Jamia, he received the reward of the people who benefited from this question, along with. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala because he was the cause for it. How many people, wallahi, ask foolish questions? And I'm amazed, honestly, and I'm, I don't cease to be amazed when I look at YouTube comments at the number of people who make really foolish comments. Have you seen his hat? Have you seen what he's wearing? I think he's doing this. I think he said that. I, very, very foolish comments and comments that show those people to be in reality you know, not embracing what it means to be a student of knowledge and not respecting the knowledge that they've been given. And you came to a YouTube class to watch a lesson, to learn something beneficial, to listen to the ayat of Allah, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the statements of the early generations. And the biggest thing you can find is what the teacher's hat looks like, and what color eyes the teacher has, and whether the teacher's cut his hair recently, and how much weight he's put on. Wallah, it's very, very foolish. It's very foolish. It's foolish and it shows that that person is not a person you expect will benefit. It's not somebody that you think when you read comments like that, that that is a person who will benefit from this. Rather, you think that this is, you know, Allahul Musta'an. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to guide us and them. Look at the benefit of this individual. He traveled all around the world, all around the Islamic world, and he wanted to travel and, and meet with Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. And when he met with him, his concern was not was how long is his beard, and what is he sitting and what is he wearing? And his concern was to get knowledge. And he asked a question that was so sincere. And we hope that that was the case. And uh, we don't declare anyone to be uh, pure. Uh, rather, Allah Azza wa Jal is known. Allah Azza wa Jal knows the one who is pure. But what we see from this is that his question was so sincere. That Allah Azza wa Jal made his question last for 700 years or more. And perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal knows how long will it last for. That this question lasted in history for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Because this is a question that really benefits the people. And we're going to hear that question in a moment. So really, you, you, that's one thing that I want you to take. The fact that this question remained benefiting the people because of its sincerity and when you take part in a class when you take part whether you attend a class whether you take part online whether you send an email when you take part in the class that you really have sincerity between you and Allah 
that I'm not here to show people the cleverness of my comments, or I'm not here to waste time, I'm not here to waste other people's time, I'm not here to cause a fitna, or to cause people to go astray, or to try and make the teacher trip up. I'm here because I want to benefit, and I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with me, and I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward me. That's what I'm here for. And that is something you see in these questions that were asked to Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Now this paragraph contains a lot of praise of Shaykh al-Islam. He's called Sayyiduna, our chief, our leader. A Shaykh al-Faqih al-Imam, the Shaykh, the, the Faqih, the one with vast knowledge, the Imam, the example for others to follow, al-Fadil al-Alim, the virtuous one, the scholar, to Salaf, he is like the, the one who remained out of the Salaf. You know, like as if you, you, you know, if you looked at the early generations, the person in our time, in his time, who resembled those early generations, it's him. He's like, he's the leftover. He's the one who's left over from the Salaf. Waqudwatul Khalaf, and the later generations, the latter generations, they follow him. Al Mubdi'ul Mughrib, Al Mu'ribul Mufsih. The one who's eloquent, he talks about the eloquence of his speech. The one who brings rare benefits that you can't get from other people. And then he says, and I want you to highlight this. He is the most knowledgeable person that I met in the East and the West. And this statement is coming from an individual who is described by Imam al-Zahabi, by al-Hafid al-Hajar, uh, by others as that he was Rahalun. He traveled extensively. He met all of the scholars of his time that he could meet, that Allah gave him the tawfiq to meet. He traveled from the east to the west and he said, I never met anyone more knowledgeable than Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala taqiyuddin Abu abbas Ahmed Ibn Taymiyyah May Allah make his barakah remain with us. And this dua that he made, in reality, Allah Azawajal answered that dua. Because until now, the barakah of that scholar, in terms of the knowledge that he left for us, we continue to study it and to benefit from it today. And remember, we said that Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala was born 661 after the Hijrah and died 700 and 28, 728. Really, we're talking about 700 years and a bit more. 700 years and a bit. And subhanAllah, we are still benefiting from the barakah that came from the answer to this question and the barakah of the question that Abu Qasim, he asked. And the last point I'm going to make on this is, uh, and I, I benefited this, I, I heard Sheikh Abdul Razak uh, Al-Badr Ta'ala say this, and I really, I noted it down because I thought it was so beneficial. He said in one of the manuscripts of this book, there is written at the end of it that a number, in other words, a number of students wrote that they heard this book from Ibn Taymiyyah, they read it to him, in, during his lifetime, among them was his brother uh, Abdullah. They, they read it in his lifetime. They read it to him in his lifetime. And they noted the date that they read it to him. And that it was in 697 uh, or something around those lines after the Hijrah. 697, roughly, after the Hijrah. They heard this book from Shaykh of Islam Taymiyyah. Now I want to ask you a question. How old was Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah at that time? He was less than 36 years old. 36 years old. And someone says about him, أَعْلَمُ مَنْ لَقِيتُ بِبِلَادِ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ I didn't meet anyone with more knowledge in the East or the West. And this is not said from a man who traveled to two or three cities. This is said from a man who traveled to as many of the cities of the Islamic world that he could and he made a deliberate effort to go from city to city and meet as many people as possible and he never met and this is at the age of 36 or younger because we don't know when 
the book was written exactly. We just know that when Sheikh al-Islam was 36, this book was being read to him. So for sure he read it, he wrote it before that. 36 years old and a person who travels all over the world says, I didn't meet anyone more knowledgeable in the East or the West than this person. And that really is profound when you think about what that says about the knowledge of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Now, continue. بأن يوصيني بما يكون فيه صلاح صلاح ديني ودنياي ويرشدني إلى كتاب يكون عليه اعتمادي في علم الحديث وكذلك في غيره من العلوم الشرعية وينبهني على أفضل الأعمال الصالحة على أفضل الأعمال الصالحة بعد الواجبات ويبين لي أرجح المكاسب كل ذلك على قصد الإيماء والاختصار والله تعالى يحفظه والسلام الكريم عليه ورحمة الله وبركاته okay. To advise me towards what would set aright my affairs concerning deen and dunya to point me towards those books which I may rely upon regarding knowledge of hadith and other sciences of the sharia, to draw my attention towards the best of righteous actions after the compulsory duties, to explain to me those qualities and skills attaining which should outweigh all my other aims. Okay, carry on. All of, all of that. Mm -hmm. All of this by way of concise guidelines, may Allah safeguard him and peace and Allah's blessings be upon him. Okay. Very good. So this is the text of the question. And as we said, you know, subhanAllah, the, the value that there is, the value that there is within a sincere question. He asked Shaykh al-Islam in reality for four things. The first thing he said, he said for a wasiyya, a wasiyya. In other words, give me an instruction. Give me an instruction. Of that which, what did they translate wasiyah as in, this, in, in the English translation here? Advice or the very beginning of the paragraph? To advise me? To advise me. To instruct me maybe is even better than that to say. To instruct me in that which will contain the, or will correct for me my religion and my worldly affairs. So the first thing he asked is give me an advice, give me an instruction. Give me a series of commands that will correct for me my deen, my religion, and my worldly affairs. And this contains so many benefits. I, I, SubhanAllah, I feel like there's not time to even speak about all of them. But from the benefits of this is that we as Muslims don't distinguish between our deen and our dunya like that, where we separate, say, you teach me in my deen, and let me go and ask this kafir what to do for my dunya. La wallah, from the best of the people to ask about what will bring about correction for your religion and your worldly affairs is to ask the people of knowledge who take that knowledge from what Allah told us and what the Prophet ﷺ told us. And this is incredibly beneficial because today we're in an age where the habit of people is to take religious knowledge and even religious knowledge, they take it from, and subhanAllah, some people who, Allahu musta'an, Allah Azza wa Jal is His help that we seek with regard to the people that, that people ask for knowledge in these days. And this is knowledge of the religion. And when it comes to the dunya, they are more than happy to ask the kafir, to ask the disbeliever, to ask the one who is the fasiq, to ask the one who is even among the disbelievers considered to be a fasiq. And they consider him to be an evildoer. But they want to ask him, how should I be successful in my dunya? Here, I want to bring about the righteousness, the correctness. I want to bring about that which will correct my religion and my dunya. Because Allah Azza wa tells us in the Quran, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in the Sunnah, that which will bring about the correction of our religion and the correction of our worldly life. And if we correct our religion, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will correct our worldly life. وَيُرْشِدَنِي إِلَىٰ كِتَاب The second thing he asked him is to guide him to a book which he can rely upon in the knowledge of hadith. 
So a book which he can rely upon in the knowledge of hadith. One of the amazing things about Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah is that he was considered really to be an expert in many different sciences, if not all of the sciences of uh, Islamic knowledge, the different sub-sciences of Islam. He was not someone who was considered to be, for example, uh, an expert in tafsir, but not in hadith, or an expert in hadith, but not in aqidah, or an expert in aqidah, but not in fiqh. Rather, in fiqh, he was an imam. In tafsir, he was an imam. In hadith, he was an imam. Uh, in every field, in aqidah, he was an imam. In the science of the Arabic language, he has, was known for his uh, for, for what he put forward in that science, in every area or almost every area of Islamic knowledge, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala was known for his uh, knowledge in that field. So he said, advise me or instruct me with regard to a book in the science of hadith and other Islamic sciences with it. And to inform me about the best of the righteous deeds after the wajibat. And this is a very intelligent question because here he might say, you know, a person in terms of what you have to do as a Muslim, that's one of the first things that a person learns. You have to pray five times a day, you have to give zakah, you have to fast, you have to, you know, the, the, the most kind of important things a person has to do. But many times a person may not be aware of the most virtuous voluntary deeds. Many people may not be aware. If you were to go around and ask an average Muslim, for example, about which prayer is the most virtuous after the five daily prayers, how many people could answer you correctly? That the most virtuous prayer after the five daily prayers. How many people would know the answer to that question? If you were to ask them the most virtuous fasting after the fasting of Ramadan, how many people would know the answer to that question? Many times people might, may not know the details of that. And then he asked, المكاسب. And for him to clarify to me, أرجح المكاسب. In your translation here, it says the skills, right? Qualities and skills. Some of the scholars, when they explain this, they said he's asking about his work. He's asking about his dunya. What's the best job for me? What's the best trade that I can do? What's the best means of earning a living that I can have? Uh, that's what some of them took it to be. That he's asking what is the best means of earning a living? Or he's asking what are the best skills by which to earn a living? Again, this goes back to what we said about asking people of knowledge and religion, even in the matters of the dunya. And we're not saying that it's forbidden to ask or to benefit something from some of the things maybe that some others have written who are not knowledgeable people, or maybe even non-Muslims. It's not forbidden to, to take a benefit from that. But for you to make that your i'timad, that's where you're, you rely upon, are these people and this is problematic as opposed to a person who says, you know, I ask the people of knowledge and sometimes if I see a benefit in how to organize my time or something like that, maybe I will take that benefit from that person who was not a scholar of Islam. But my first uh, sort of place that I go to for knowledge about my religion and my worldly life are the people of knowledge, the people of the knowledge of the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he said, all of this, the intention behind it, I ask for you to make it something which is summarized in nature. Something which you point out things for me, but without huge amount of length or detail, without huge amount of length or huge amount of detail in it. And that is also incredibly important and incredibly beneficial, is that he suggested to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah that I'm not looking for a really, really long answer. As in, I'm not looking for you to write a book. Now this is, brings us to the topic of the generosity of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala with his time. 
the generosity of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala with his, his wealth and other things. One of the things it is mentioned that when someone would ask him a question, he didn't give one word answers. Is it permissible for me to do this? No, halal. It's permissible. Mm. It wasn't like that. Rather, he would answer with details and benefits and he would, it would often become a, a risala or a letter or a book that he would write to answer somebody's question. So he was known for this generosity. In fact, in numerous places in his fatawa, it is written in numerous places in his fatawa that he apologized to the questioner because he ran out of paper to write the answer to their, to write the complete answer to their question. In other words, they asked him, is this allowed, is this? And from his answer, he filled all of the paper they gave him until he didn't have any more paper left to write the answer to them. And he had to only apologize that I wa wanted to write more, but I don't have any more paper than this paper to write. And he filled the paper with it. SubhanAllah. Answering people's questions. And that's from the generosity of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. In terms of asking beneficial questions, we said this question is basically four things. The first thing is that which will bring about the correction and the rectification of my religion and my worldly affairs. The second thing is a book that I can rely on in hadith and other knowledge of the sharia. The third thing is the best voluntary actions after the obligatory ones. And the fourth thing is the best means of earning a living or the best skills by which to earn a living. These four things that he asked, he asked for it to be summarized. And we said that this is a very beneficial question. Now, when we're talking about beneficial questions, we have to mention that the asl in beneficial questions, su'alat and nafi'ah, are the questions that the Sahaba asked to the Prophet ﷺ. These are the greatest of benefit, and this is where we are, we are trying to emulate what those Sahaba did. And this is part of the benefit and the hikmah of why the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, why they were companions. Why were they companions? And why were they the people who were with the Prophet ﷺ? If you want to see the hikmah in this, and just one hikmah, and there are many, but if you just want to see one of the hikmah, one wisdom, look at the kind of questions they ask the Prophet ﷺ. And look at the kind of questions that people ask the people of knowledge today. And then you see the great benefit from those Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and how much it is that they were so keen for good. And I'm going to give you one example. The hadith of Waftu Abdul Qais. This hadith, and I remember this is the first hadith I was taught in my first ever lesson in Kulit al Hadith. And it was Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr, Habibullah Ta'ala, who taught that lesson. The very first ever lesson I had in Kulit al Hadith. First day, first lesson, first teacher was Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr, Habibullah Ta'ala, whose explanation we are broadly looking at here. And he mentioned this hadith because of its importance. And that is that when Wafd Abdul Qais, they came to the Prophet ﷺ, the delegation of Abdul Qais, and they told the Prophet ﷺ that we can't come to you except in the sacred months. Because between us and you, there is this tribe min kuffari mudar, from the disbelievers of mudar. They fight against us. We can't reach you. Then they said to the Prophet ﷺ, Famurna. بِقَوْلٍ فَصْلٍ Command us, any awsina, give us a wasiyah. فَمُرْنَا بِقَوْلٍ فَصْلٍ Give us a comprehensive statement. نُخْبِرُ بِهِ مَنْ وَرَاءَنَا وَنَدْخُرُ بِهِ الْجَنَّةِ We will inform those people we left behind so that we can inform those people we left behind and we can enter Jannah. SubhanAllah, look at the benefit of that question. Allah, this is the, the part of the wisdom and Allah knows best as to why these people were the companions of the Prophet They didn't come to ask him about the pointless and useless things that people ask about. 
we have come to you in a state of war. There's a tribe that is at war with us. We came in great difficulty. Give us a comprehensive, detailed commandment that we can tell the people we left behind when at Khulubihil Jannah. Sheikh Abdul Razak, when he told me this hadith in the first lesson that I had, I remember he asked a question. He said that Imam Ahmed was asked about sincerity in seeking knowledge. And he replied, That you have the intention to remove ignorance from yourself and other people. And I remember the Shaykh, he asked the question, he said, what is the link between Imam Ahmed, what he said, and between the hadith of Wafd Abdul Qais, the delegation of Abdul Qais? And the link in this particular, the link between these two things is clear. They said, فَمُرْنَا بِقَوْلٍ فَصْلٍ نُخْبِرُ بِهِ مَنْ وَرَأَنَا We will inform the people we left behind. In other words, our intention from this thing that you tell us, O Messenger of Allah, is we are going to go back to our people and correct them through it. وَنَدْخُرُ بِهِ الْجَنَّةِ And we're going to correct ourselves through it and enter Jannah through it. Tell us something that we will inform those we left behind and we'll enter into Jannah. In other words, something by which we will correct ourselves and we will correct other people. And that's the correct intention. And ten we are رَفْعَ جَهْلٍ عَنْ نَفْسِكَ وَعَنْ غَيْرِكَ That you have the intention of removing ignorance from yourself and from others. And really this is the most fundamental thing that we have in explaining or showing to us how to ask a beneficial question. The beneficial question is the one that corrects the person and it corrects others. Or it corrects others and or. It corrects the person. Sometimes you ask a question to correct other people. What's the evidence of asking a question to correct other people? The hadith of Jibreel, right? The hadith of Jibreel. In which Jibreel came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Muhammad, akhbirni anil Islam. Oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. Akhbirni anil Iman. Akhbirni anil Ihsan. Did Jibreel not know what Islam is? Did Jibreel not know what Iman is? Or what Ihsan is? Of course he did. That's why when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him, he said, Sadaqt. You told the truth. And then at the end of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said that this was Jibreel. أَتَاكُمْ لِيُعَلِّمَكُمْ أُمُورَ دِينِكُمْ أو كما قال, He came to teach you your religion. I by asking a beneficial question that he knew the answer to, but it was going to be, the answer was going to benefit the people who were present. So you ask a question that benefits you or it benefits others or it benefits you and it benefits others. That is the question that is the most beneficial and that's the question that is really going to remain. That's the question that is really going to remain because Allah told us, Allah told us that the, the, the foam on the top of the, the uh, when the water flows through the valley, and you have like a flood water, and the rubbish that is carried on top of the flow, the flood water, it goes away. It just disappears. And what benefits the people? This is what stays on the earth. This is what stays on the earth. In Surah Al-Ra'd, this is what stays on the earth. What remains on the earth is what benefits people. And that's what Allah causes to remain from the beneficial questions. What benefits people? That's what Allah causes to remain on the earth. So that which is sincere for Allah, that which benefits you and it benefits others or, it be, or it's intended to benefit others, that which is done sincerely for the sake of Allah and that which is, it, you can see the benefit from it by the fact that it remains among people. So these are the four questions that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah was asked and we're now going to start and hear the answer that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he gave to these questions. Yeah. 
فأجاب شيخ الإسلام بحر العلوم ابن تيمية رحمه الله ورضي عنه ابن ابن تيمية رحمه ابن تيمية ابن تيمية رحمه الله ورضي عنه الحمد لله رب العالمين أما الوصية فما أعلم وصية أنفع من وصية الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم لمن عقلها واتبعها قال تعالى ولقد وصينا الذين أوتوا الكتاب من قبلكم وإياكم أن اتقوا الله ووصى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم معاذا لما بعثه إلى اليمن فقال يا معاذ اتق الله حيث ما كنت وأتبع السيئة الحسنة تمحها وخالق الناس بخلق حسن The Sheikh of Islam, Ocean of Learning, Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah bestow his mercy and pleasure on him, answered, All praise be to Allah, Lord of the worlds. As for the wasiyyah, I know of no wasiyyah more beneficial than that of Allah and his messenger for the one who understands it. The wasiyyah of Allah, the mighty and sublime. The wasiyyah of Allah, the exalted, is mentioned in the following ayah. وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Verily, we have enjoined on those who were given the book before you and on you to fear Allah. The Messenger's wasiyya. When the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'ad رضي الله عنه to Yemen, he enjoined the following upon him. O Mu'ad, fear Allah wherever you may be and follow up a bad deed with a good one and will wipe it out and behave towards people with beautiful manners. فأجاب شيخ الإسلام بحر العلوم ابن بحر العلوم ابن بحر العلوم ابن تيمية رحمه الله تعالى ورضي عنه. So شيخ الإسلام the ocean of knowledge ابن تيمية رحمه الله تعالى ورضي عنه. May Allah have mercy on him and be pleased with him. Replied الحمد لله رب العالمين. شيخ الإسلام he began he began with the الحمد لله الحمد لله and he began with this following the example of the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala began his book with Surah Al-Fatiha and he began Surah Al-Fatiha with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would begin his khutab, his speeches and matters of importance with his statement, Inna alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. So beginning with the hamdala, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began his speech with. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began his lessons and lectures and, uh, and advice with. And this is what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala began this answer with. As for alhamd, then it is athana, it is praise of Allah. And this praise of Allah is for two things. It is praise of Allah for Allah's names and attributes and actions. And it's praise of Allah for his blessings and the gifts that he bestows upon us. So we praise Allah Azza wa Jal for his asma, wa sifat, wal af'al, his names and his attributes and his actions. And we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings upon us. The greatest of which in this world is the blessing of Islam. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِسْيَانِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ Allah said, it is Allah who made Iman beloved to you and he made it beautiful in your hearts and he made you hate disbelief and defiance and disobedience it is those people who are rightly guided as a grace from Allah and a blessing your Iman, your Islam your love of what Allah loves and your hatred of what Allah hates all of that is a gift from Allah. 
It's not something you deserve. It's not something that you have done so much good that you deserve it. Rather, it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a gift from Allah, Azza wa Jal. And so we say, Alhamdulillah, for the gifts that Allah gave us, the gift of Islam, the gift of Iman, the gift of the truth, the gift of knowing what is right from what is wrong, the gift of guidance, and also for Allah, and before that, for Allah's lofty names and attributes and actions. So we praise Allah for his mahasin, his beautiful qualities, and we also praise Allah for his ihsan towards us, his kindness towards us. And we praise Allah in every situation. Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. We praise Allah in every situation because Allah Azza wa Jal, His mahasin, His beautiful qualities, His names and attributes and actions do not cease at times when things are difficult or at times when things, when we are struggling. So we continue to praise Allah ala kulli hal. And His ni'am, His blessings don't stop when we're going through times of difficulty. Rather from his blessings is that those difficulties don't drive us to disbelief or take us away from Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to shower his blessings upon us in times of ease and hardship. And Allah Azawajal continues to have the most beautiful names and attributes and actions in times of ease and hardship. So we praise Allah in every situation. And Allah is Rabbul Alameen. Rabb is a Sayyidul Malik al Mata, the one who is the chief who is the king, the supreme sovereign, the one who is obeyed in every situation. This is what the meaning of the word Rabb is in Arabic, Sayyidul Malik al Muta'. And as for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the Alameen. And Alameen is plural of Alam, which is world. So the Lord of the worlds, the world of the of human beings, the world of the jinn, the world of the angels, the world which is high and the world which is low, the world of the animals, the world of all the different worlds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their Rabb. And from the meanings of the word Rabb is Al-Murabbi, the one who nurtures you and takes care of you and looks after you, and the one who nurtures you in faith. And this special nurturing is different from the tarbiyah, Am, the general nurturing which Allah gives to all of his creation, the Muslim, the non-Muslim, the animal, Allah nurtures all of them in a general sense. But the specific special nurturing that Allah gives to his believing servants, this is deserving of praise upon praise. Praise above the praise that Allah is deserving of for his general guidance and his general nurturing that he gives to all of his creation, then he is deserving of a praise that is a praise upon another praise. And that is the praise for the special nurturing of Iman and the guidance to Islam. So with that in mind, the Shaykh he began, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. He said, Amma al-wasiyya, as for this wasiyya that you have asked me for, because that was the first thing he asked for, right? The first thing he said, that he gives me advice or he gives me instruction as to that which will bring about the rectification of my religion and my worldly affairs. He said, As for this advice or this instruction, he said, as for this advice, I do not know of any instruction more beneficial than the instruction of Allah and the instruction of His Messenger This is from, alone could be a lecture on its own. Because this in itself, the first thing that Shaykh al-Islam is saying is, don't take my wasiyah. My wasiyah, inshallah, it will benefit you. But don't take my wasiyah. I'm going to give you the wasiyah of Allah and the wasiyah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm going to give you the wasiyah of Allah and the wasiyah of the Messenger. And this is a huge benefit. And I want everyone, if you're taking notes, write this down. 
that knowledge is al-kitabu wa sunnah That is what knowledge is. It is the Qur'an and the sunnah. And everything after that is just background noise. Or it's supporting or it's explaining or supporting that knowledge. But the knowledge that you are seeking and your cost that you're aiming for is not the knowledge of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. It's not that you're aiming, that your ghaya is, I want to know something from Ibn Taymiyyah. Your ghaya is to reach the kitab and the sunnah. That's what Shaykh al-Islam is telling you. He said, first, as for my wasiyah, that I don't know of any wasiyah more beneficial than the wasiyah of Allah and the wasiyah of the Rasul. So he's connecting that person's heart to the Qur'an and the sunnah. Connecting them to hold on to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Yes, use me, Ibn Taymiyyah ta'ala, use me as a, a means to, a, to, to get that advice. I'll bring it out for you and lay it out for you and explain it to you bit by bit. But that knowledge that you are attaching your heart to, it has to be the Kitab and the Sunnah. And how many people in this day and age and before this day and age went astray because they made their goal, their ghaya, the kalam of the ulama. They made their goal the speech of the scholars. They made it their goal. I want to know everything that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala said, my goal is the kalam of Abi Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala. That's my goal. That's where I stop. And when you ask them about the kitab and the sunnah, they say, kitab and sunnah, don't, don't ask me about kitab and sunnah. It's not, I'm not qualified for that. I only want what Abu Hanifa said, or what Malik said, or what Shafi'i said, or what Ahmed said. Rahimahumullah ta'ala. And in reality, this will never bring success to a person. Your goal and your attachment is the Qur'an and the sunnah. That's your knowledge. That's what the wahi, the revelation, that's the haqq. That's the truth. Everything else is either a means to reach the kitab and the sunnah or it's just, as we said, background noise. It's either a means to reach the kitab and the sunnah or really it doesn't come under al-ilm al-nafi' it doesn't come under beneficial knowledge. And this is what Shaykh al-Islam right from the beginning, he doesn't say, my advice to you is to have taqwa because Allah said have taqwa. He didn't say that. He didn't say my advice is to have taqwa because Allah said have taqwa. He said, I don't know any advice more beneficial than the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Go back to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. That's where you're going to find your advice. Then he's going to frame that advice for him, explain it to him, clarify it to him. Amazing. But that's a step ladder to reach the Kitab and the Sunnah. And anytime you get to the mentality that your goal is to reach the statement of a scholar or the opinion of a scholar, or whatever that scholar says is the haqq and whatever they don't say is the batil, this is in reality a talal, it's misguidance. Because the haqq is the kitab and the sunnah. The truth is the Qur'an and the sunnah. Everything else is either a means to access the Qur'an and the sunnah, or, as we said, is from those things that are not truly beneficial knowledge. So here, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah ta straight away says to him, as for the advice, I'm giving it to you straight from the Kitab and the Sunnah. The advice of Allah, Allah's wasiyah. Now how much more powerful is it now? It's not the wasiyah of ibn Taymiyyah. I'm going to give you Allah's wasiyah to his creation. Allah's wasiyah to his believed servants. I'm going to give you that wasiyah. Allah's wasiyah to his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we're going to hear in some ayat that Allah azza wa jal advised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the same wasiyah. The advice of Allah. Allah's command. Allah's instruction. And the advice the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave to his companions. لِمَنْ عَقَلَهَا وَاتَّبَعَهَا for the one who aqalaha, who really understands it. The one who understands it. And the one who follows it. And here I want you to highlight, if you're making notes, highlight this, it's very important. Aqalaha, 
understands it, follows it, this is the consistent theme that Ibn Taymiyyah is going to bring, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Shaykh al-Islam, which is this consistent theme of understanding and action. Al-Fahmu and Al-Amal. Understanding and action. Many people have one or the other. Some people have none. Some people have none. Summun bukmun umyun. فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Deaf, dumb and blind, they do not understand anything. I, and the deafness and dumbness and blindness here is not the loss of their sight or the loss of their hearing or the loss of their ability to speak, but it's the loss of their ability to think and understand what's being said to them. سُمُّنْ بُكْمُنْ عُمْيُنْ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Deaf, dumb and blind, they do not understand anything. That is the person who has no fahm, nor do they have any amal. They do not act upon it, and they don't understand it. But there are two groups of people that Allah mentioned to us in Surah Al-Fatiha. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ Not those who are angry, you are angry with, those that you are angry with, المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Nor the path of those that are astray. المغضوب عليهم Those people who are, have earned Allah's anger. The Prophet ﷺ, he explained this uh, ayah, he said, اليهود والنصارى It's the Jews and the Christians, أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم But there's a broader question to be asked about it, which is why? And the answer is that one of these groups has knowledge but not action. And the other one has action but not knowledge. As for the one that has knowledge but not action, then this was characteristic, or this is a characteristic of the Yahud. A people who have knowledge, great amount of knowledge about what Allah made halal and what Allah made haram, and they have scripture and they have attachment to prophethood. They have knowledge. But the actions of those people doesn't weigh up with the knowledge that they have. The action isn't in line with the knowledge they have. And as for an nasara the Christians, then typically what you see from them is plenty of action. But that action is not built upon ilm, it's not built upon knowledge. It's built upon jahl, jahl al-murakkab, compound ignorance. Ignorance and being ignorant of the fact that you're ignorant. That's what we call compound ignorance, jahl al-murakkab. That you're ignorant and you don't even know you're ignorant. So the only person or the only people we are told to be among اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Guide us to the path of those that, uh, upon whom you bestowed your favor They are the people who join between العلم والعمل Between knowledge and action And this is a theme that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah رحمه الله تعالى is going to mention repeatedly throughout this advice and instruction that he gives and that is the theme of knowledge and action here he talks about al-aql really comprehending it and al-ittiba following it knowledge and action so these two things will only only with these two things will a person benefit from the advice of Allah the advice of the prophet the instruction from Allah and the instruction from the Prophet وسلم, the only time that we will benefit from those instructions is if we have knowledge of them and action. As for if we know what Allah instructed us, I know what Allah told me to do. I know what Allah told me to do, but I'm not doing it. Or I don't even know the difference between what Allah told me or what He didn't. How many people, they say there's a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, and they bring something that was said by can, even a non-Muslim. Maybe not even a Muslim, let alone, you know, they bring something that is a quote from Gandhi or something like that. They say the Prophet ﷺ said, and subhanAllah, people who have knowledge and no action, and people who have action and no knowledge, neither of these two people will benefit from the wasiya of Allah and the wasiya of the Rasul ﷺ. Rather, the people that will benefit from the wasiyah of Allah, 
the instruction of Allah and the instruction of His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are the people who first of all have knowledge and then action. فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ Know that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and then seek forgiveness for your sins. Knowledge and action. Knowledge and action. Immediately, Shaykh al-Islam quotes the ayah. He doesn't say what the advice is. He doesn't say, وَهَذِهِ الْوَصِيَّةِ هِيَ وَصِيَّةُ التَّقْوَى This wasiyah is the wasiyah of taqwa. وَهَذِهِ الْوَصِيَّةِ He doesn't mention anything about it. He just says, I don't know anything more beneficial than this ayah and this hadith. Now in reality, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala could have brought many ayat because this wasiyah, which is called wasiyatullah, Allah's instruction to his people, to his creation, Allah's instruction to his creation, and the instruction of the Prophet ﷺ to his ummah, this is said to be the most common, the most common shara'i term that is mentioned in the entire Qur'an. They say the, 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 the shara'i term that is most frequently mentioned in the Qur'an. In other words, if you gathered all the words that are most frequent in the Qur'an and you remove the words that are linguistic, like from and to and so on, the word that is said to be or the term that is said to be the most common or among the most common is this particular word, at-taqwa. And the ayah is, وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ we had instructed, was, we have wasayna. Wasayna here is wasiyah. We had given the wasiyah to those who were given the scripture before you and to you. Those who were given the scripture uh, before you and to you. And this wasiyah that Allah gave, Allah said, وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا We certainly gave this wasiyah to the people who came before you, were given the scripture before you, and we're going to give it to you, we're giving it to you. And And that wasiyah is taqwa of Allah, to have taqwa of Allah. Now here in the English translation, it says to fear Allah. And I actually think that's not a great translation. I, I don't really, I really don't like that translation as, as a translation of taqwa, which we're going to talk about inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, you know, as we go forward in this uh, in this discussion, inshallah, in, in in this evening, we're going to talk, inshallah, ta'ala, about the meaning of taqwa. I personally, even in my, my khutbah, my khutbah, I try not to translate it as fear Allah, because it's not really what the word taqwa means. It's much, much more than that. Fear of Allah is al khawf or al khashya. Uh, you know, to have khashya of Allah, have khawf of Allah. Taqwa is something very different, which we're going to talk about, inshallah ta'ala, in a moment. This wasiya, the wasiya of Allah to al awwalina wal akhirin. Some of the scholars, they called it that. Wasiya to Allah, lil awwalina wal akhirin. It is Allah's instruction that He gave repeatedly to the first people and the last people. Right? To everybody, the very first person. On this earth, to the very last one, Allah gave them the same single instruction. Ittaqullah. Have taqwa of Allah. Then Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he quotes the hadith of Mu'adh. Mu'adh ibn Jabal al-Ansari al-Khazraji uh, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu ardah. Mu'adh ibn Jabal when he sent him to Yemen. And we're going to talk about him sending Mu'adh to Yemen in a moment, inshaAllah ta'ala. And he said, فَقَالَ يَا مُعَاذ He said, O oh Mu'adh, اِتَّقِ اللَّهَ حَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُ Have taqwa of Allah wherever you are. And again, I find, I find that to be a more accurate translation than saying fear Allah, to say have taqwa of Allah wherever you are. وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُوهَا And follow up the bad deed with a good one, it will wipe it out. وَخَارِقِ النَّاسَ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ 
and treat the people with the best of manners. This is really the answer to the first part of the question, which Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala was asked to give me advice as to that which will correct my religion and my worldly affairs. The answer to this is the wasiyah of Allah, the wasiyah of Allah and the wasiyah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did Allah advise his creation and instruct them with? What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advise his companions with and instruct them with? And this word taqwa comes many, many times. In fact, it comes in the Quran with so many benefits, with so many different rewards. Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will make him a way out of every problem. And he will give him uh, provision from wherever he, he where, from where he did not imagine. So we have, first of all, that Allah Azawajal will give you a way out of every problem. That Allah will give you rizq because of taqwa. Have taqwa of Allah and Allah will teach you. يُسْرَى Whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will make his situation easy for him. And you can keep going and going. We can reach maybe, Allah knows better, how many things that Allah said, if you have taqwa, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَهْلَ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقَوْ لَفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِّنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ If only the people of the towns had taqwa and iman, iman and taqwa, we would have bestowed upon them the blessings of the heavens and the earth. So what is this thing? This thing that Allah said, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَىٰ If you're going to go on a journey, take your provision, your journey to the hereafter. Take your provision. And the best thing you can take is taqwa. So the best thing you can take on your journey to the hereafter is taqwa. Taqwa gives you a way out of every problem. Taqwa gives you rizq, gives you wealth and provision. Taqwa makes things easy for you. Taqwa teaches you everything that you need to know. Uh, taqwa brings the blessings of the heavens and the earth. And many, many, many other virtues of taqwa which are mentioned in the Quran. So what is this taqwa? Now, Ibn Taymiyyah, we said he could have chosen any of those ayat. He could have said, وَتَزَوَّدُوا فَإِنَّ خَيْرَ الزَّادِ التَّقْوَىٰ وَاتَّقُونِيَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ and prepare for your journey. And the best thing you can prepare for your journey is taqwa and have taqwa of me, O people of understanding. He could have chosen, وَاتَّقُوا wa يُعَلِّمُكُمُ Allah. Have taqwa of Allah and Allah will teach you. He could have chosen, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجَعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ But he chose this ayah. And he chose this ayah. We're going to hear more reasons for this later, but primarily here, because this ayah clarifies that this is Allah's wasiyah. وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا We, i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has given this wasiyah to al-awwalina wal-akhirin, to the first people and the last of them. Allah has given this wasiyah to all of them. This is Allah's wasiyah. More than that, it's the wasiyah of the Prophet sallallahu now again, the question might come, and we still haven't gotten to talking about what taqwa is and so on. But the question might come, why the hadith of Mu'adh? The hadith of Al-Irbad, Nusariya, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave the advice to have a taqwa. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave the advice to all of the people to have taqwa in that hadith. In other hadith, he gave advice to other companions. Why are we taking specifically the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal al-Ansari wa al-Khazraji radiyallahu an? Why Mu'adh? Why Mu'adh's hadith? Ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt. Have taqwa of Allah wherever you are. Wa atbi'i sayyata al-hasanata tamuha. And wipe out and follow up the bad deed with a good one. It will wipe it out. Why this one specifically? So inshallah ta'ala that will become clear as will the meaning of at-taqwa inshallah ta'ala as we read the next 
uh, paragraph, inshallah ta'ala. وكان معاذ رضي الله عنه من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بمنزلة علية فإنه قال له يا معاذ والله إني لا أحبك وكان يردفه وراءه وروي فيه أنه أعلم الأمة بالحلال والحرام وأنه يحشر أمام العلماء برتوة أي بخطوة ومن فضله أنه بعثه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مبلغا عنه داعيا ومفقها ومفتيا وحاكما إلى أهل اليمن وكان يشبهه بإبراهيم الخليل عليه السلام وإبراهيم إمام الناس وكان ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه يقول إن معاذا كان أمة قانتا لله حنيفا ولم يكن من المشركين تشبيها له بإبراهيم The excellence of Mu'ad ibn Jabal رضي الله عنه Mu'ad radiallahu an had a high status in the eyes of the Prophet for he once said to him, O oh Mu'ad, by Allah, truly I love you. Sometimes the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will let Mu'ad radiallahu an ride behind him on the same mount. It's also narrated about him that he is the most knowledgeable person in the Ummah about the issues of halal and haram. And, and that on that the day of resurrection, he'll be raised up one step ahead of all the people of knowledge. Part of Mu'ad's excellence further is that the Prophet ﷺ sent him to the people of Yemen as a preacher on his behalf, a caller, a teacher of understanding in the deen, a giver of religious verdicts and a judge. He also used to compare Mu'ad to Ibrahim السلام, the friend of Allah and Imam of mankind. Ibn Mas'ud used to say, Verily, Mu'ad is the leader of the people. He is Allah's obedient slave and he is, non, he is not of the polytheists. Thus comparing him to Ibrahim. The Prophet. That's enough. Hasbuk. Zakhallah khairan. So we're now going to, in this here, hear the answer as to why Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah chose the hadith of Mu'adh. And I'm actually going to ask you because I, I like, you know, even though this is quite a, you know, I'm just talking to the camera and, and you know, inshallah ta'ala, everyone is, is following on at home. But I would like everyone to have a real think about this as we read through the virtues of Mu'adh ibn Jabal. And then at the end of it, for you to tell me, and I don't, do we have access to comments? We do. Brilliant. For you to tell me on the comments why you think that this relates to the reason why Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah chose this hadith of Mu'adh over the hadith of Al-Irbad ibn Sariya radiallahu anhu or the many, many other hadith that contain the ad specific advice for taqwa. I mean the hadith of Al-Irbad ibn Sariya, the Prophet وسلم, is giving advice to the ummah that for the whole, all of the sahaba, for the whole ummah, my advice to you is taqwa of Allah. Why the hadith of Mu'adh? Let's read through what Shaykh al-Islam said. We'll explain it to you, inshallah. And at the end of this paragraph, before we start reading the next section or before the reader starts reading the next section, inshallah, we'll ask you the question, why did Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah choose the hadith of Mu'adh over those other hadith? Mu'adh radiallahu an had a high status in the sight of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That's the statement. That's the headline, okay? Now Shaykh al-Islam is going to mention approximately six, we can count them, I think there's around six, reasons why Mu'adh had a high status in the sight of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one, he said to him, Ya Mu'adh, Wallahi inni la uhibbuk. O Mu'adh, by Allah, I certainly love you. And in some of the narrations he repeated it, O Mu'adh, by Allah, I certainly love you. O Mu'adh, by Allah, I certainly love you. SubhanAllah, what a position to have. For the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam to say to Mu'adh, wa Mu'adh, كان من صغار الصحابة رضي الله عنهم. Mu'adh was a, a young Sahabi, he was not an old, he was a young Sahabi, he was not an old, uh, he was not an older Sahabi, like Abu Bakr and Umar. He was a young boy. The Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi a young man, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, O oh, Mu'adh, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, Inni, I certainly, La'uhibbuk, I certainly love you. 
He emphasized it three times. Wallahi, inni la. Wallahi, inni la. Three emphasis. By Allah, I truly and certainly love you. By Allah, I truly, certainly love you. By Allah, I certainly, truly love you. Like that. Three emphasis, three points of emphasis of how much he loved Mu'adh, radiallahu an. This is in the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ, he told Mu'adh, don't leave at the end of every prayer saying, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. So this is the, what the Prophet ﷺ advised Mu'adh. He said, I certainly love you. I certainly love you. I certainly love you. By Allah, I certainly love you. By Allah, I certainly love you. By Allah, I certainly love you. So do not leave at the end of every prayer, i.e. at the end of the tashahud before the salam, saying, Allahumma. أَعِنِّي عَلَى ذِكْرِكَ وَشُكْرِكَ وَحُسْنِ عِبَادَتِكَ Oh Allah, help me to worship you, help me to remember you, and help me to be grateful to you, and help me to worship you with excellence. And that's something that we should all be following. وَكَانَ يُرْدِفُهُ وَرَأَهُ And he used to ride with Mu'adh behind him on the same mount. On the same mount. And from this is the famous hadith which is reported by Al Bukhari and Muslim from Mu'adh ibn Jabal, in which Mu'adh said, Kuntu radif al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallama ala himarin. And that's a little note just for when you're reading that when you come to sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you want to keep reading, then you read sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a fatha on the end, okay? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Kuntu radif al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala himar. I was riding along with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I was behind him on the same donkey. Faqala li, he said to me, Ya Mu'adh. He said, O Mu'adh, Atadri ma haqqu Allahi ala al-ibad wa ma haqqu al-ibadi ala Allah. Do you know what Allah's right is over his servants and what the servants write is over Allah qala qultu Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam Mu'ad said Allah and his messenger know best somebody might ask just on a small side point on the topic of Allah and his messenger know best is this not equating the prophet sallallahu to Allah the answer is no the reason for that is that this is said after revelation comes to the prophet sallallahu in other words Allah knows best and has given revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and therefore Allah and His Messenger know best. Allah and His Messenger know best because the knowledge of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it comes from the revelation of Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah and His Messenger know best. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said حَقُّ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوهُ وَلَا يُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا The right of Allah over His servant is to worship him and not make any partner with him. وَحَقُّ الْعِبَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ أَنْ لَا يُعَذِّبَ مَنْ لَا يُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا And the right of the servants over Allah is that Allah does not punish a person who doesn't make any partner with him. Mu'ad said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, أَفَلَا أُبَشِّرُ النَّاسِ Shall I not give the people the glad tidings that if they worship Allah alone, Allah will not punish them? The Prophet ﷺ said, لا تبشرهم فيتكلوا Don't give them those glad tidings in case they become reliant upon it. أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم And this Mu'adh he told at the end of his life when he feared that the knowledge would be lost. He passed that knowledge on uh, from the Prophet ﷺ. So this is an evidence that he used to, and the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, that he used to have him behind him on a donkey. So, First of all, the Prophet ﷺ said, I certainly, truly love you. And he said it multiple times. Number two, that he used to carry Mu'adh behind him, riding on the same animal. Number three, وَرُوِيَفِي It's narrated about him that Mu'adh is the most knowledgeable of the Ummah in the Halal and the Haram. The hadith is, أَعْلَمُ النَّاسِ بِحَلَالِ اللَّهِ وَحَرَامِ The hadith is Mu'adh ibn Jabal. أَعْلَمُ النَّاسِ بِحَلَالِ اللَّهِ وَحَرَامِ That Mu'adh ibn Jabal is the most knowledgeable of the people regarding the halal and the haram 
uh, Allah's halal and haram. Notice this word ruya, ruya. Generally, this word ruya is used, especially if someone is being precise. It's used, they call it sirat al-tamrir. It's used to indicate that the hadith may have a weakness in it. So when, be careful, in English we pass it on by, right? We just read, and it's narrated that, and it's narrated that Mu'ad is, this word, it is narrated, is used when the hadith has a weakness in it, or when it may have a weakness in it, when you're not sure. When the great scholar of hadith is sure that the Prophet ﷺ said it, he will say, qala, the Prophet ﷺ said, or he will say something similar to that. But when there's, or he will say, rawa, so and so, and in Nabi Sallallahu But this word ruya, it has been narrated. It has been narrated. This word is used when you fear that there may be some weakness in the chain or you're not sure about its authenticity. And I, I don't actually have anything on the authenticity for this, except the hadith uh, that Mu'adh ibn Jabal is the most knowledgeable of the halal of Allah and his haram. And Allah knows best. I didn't uh, manage to look up the authenticity, perhaps tomorrow. We can look up the authenticity for that, inshallah ta'ala. But this word ruya straight away stands out that, you know, check it. I'm not going to say to you it's definitely authentic. Check it. That's what the word ruya means. That he's the most knowledgeable of this ummah in the halal and the haram. And it may be that the hadith is authentic, but Shaykh al-Islam didn't have the narration for it or the chain for it to be sure or wasn't sure about it, for example. So that's why I use the word ruya. Uh, that Mu'ad is the most knowledgeable of the people about the halal and the haram. وَأَنَّهُ يُحْشَرُ أَمَامَ الْعُلَمَاءِ بِرَتْوَةِ That he will be put forward in front of the scholars by a ratwa. And here, uh, here, Shaykh al-Islam, he explains that ratwa means khutwa, a footstep. In other words, he'll be one step ahead of the scholars Yawm al-Qiyamah. However, there are other narrations that explain this in a different way. Shaykh al-Islam, he explained that ratwa means khutwa. But there are narrations here that say bi ratwatin bi hajar. That he will be a stone's throw ahead of them. And both mean the same thing. But uh, the word ratwa comes with different meanings. But one of them is ratwa to hajar. Meaning a stone's throw. As, as you sto throw a stone that far forward. Uh, and that's what it seems to me to be the correct meaning of ratwa here because there are narrations like that. Bi ratwatin bi hajar. He will be a stone's throw ahead of the scholars. Or he will be a footstep ahead of the scholars. So now we had what? We had uh, that the Prophet said that he loves him, that he used to let him ride behind him on the same donkey, that it's narrated that he is the most knowledgeable of the people of the halal and the haram. Separately, it's narrated that he will be put ahead of the scholars by a stone's throw ahead of the scholars on the Day of Judgment. And, وَمِنْ فَضْلِهِ أَنَّهُ بَعَثَهُ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ مُبَلِّغًا عَنْهُ The Prophet ﷺ sent him as a preacher, as a caller, as a teacher, as a mufti, and as a judge to the people of Yemen. And that, if I'm not mistaken, makes five reasons why Mu'adh had a manzila aliyah high status in the sight of the Prophet The Prophet sent him to Yemen as a muballigh to transmit and convey the hadith of the Prophet as a da'iyah to call the people to Islam, as a mufaqih, as a teacher to teach them the halal and the haram, as a mufti to give them fatawa, and as a hakim, as a judge, and he sent him to the people of Yemen for that reason. Here it says in the Arabic printed text, وَكَانَ يُشَبِّهُهُ بِإِبْرَاهِيمِ That the Prophet وسلم, used to say that he, or used to uh, mention the resemblance between Mu'ad and Ibrahim. Actually here, this, we don't know of a hadith for this. And instead, in some of the, the, the nusakh, the, the, the manuscripts, in one of them it says, وَكَانُوا يُشَبِّهُونَهُ بِإِبْرَاهِيمِ وَكَانُوا يُشَبِّهُونَهُ The companions used to say that he resembles Ibrahim. And this is what is correct. 
This is what is correct. The companions used to do so. Or وَكَانَ يُشَبَّهُ With dropping the ha here. In other words, the second ha is a mistake in the, in the, in the text. And it should either be وَكَانَ يُشَبَّهُ بِإِبْرَاهِيمِ That people used to or someone used to or it was said that he resembles Ibrahim. In other words, not mentioning the Prophet specifically. وَكَانَ يُشَبَّهُ بِإِبْرَاهِيمِ or وَكَانُوا يُشَبِّهُونَهُ where it's a plural that they used to resemble to Ibrahim. It is possible that this is from Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah and he knew of a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ in which the Prophet ﷺ caused or, or said that Mu'adh resembles Ibrahim. But based on the siyaq here, the context, he then quotes Abdullah ibn Mas'ud doing the same thing. So if he had a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ, then it doesn't make sense to quote Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Uh, so it seems to me that either this should be, the text should be وَكَانُوا يُشَبِّهُونَهُ بِإِبْرَاهِيمِ they used, they used to, i.e. the companions used to say that he resembles Ibrahim or وَكَانَ يُشَبَّهُ without mentioning who did it. It could be the Prophet, it could be Ibn Mas'ud, it could be that it was said that he resembles Ibrahim. Al-Khalil, Ibrahim, the beloved of Allah alayhi salam Ibrahim was the Imam al Nas, he was the example for mankind. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an said, Inna Mu'adhan kana ummah. Mu'adh was an ummah. An ummah, we know the word ummah, what does the word ummah mean? Nation, right? The word ummah, it means nation. So, how can you describe Ibrahim? Of course, in the Quran, Allah said that Ibrahim was ummah, an ummah. And Ibn Mas'ud is comparing Mu'adh and saying Mu'adh was an Ummah. The word Ummah here, it means Imamun fil khair. He was a leader in goodness. Ummah, he was an Ummah, he was an Imam, a leader for the people in good. Qanitan, Qanitan lillah, here, the Qanitan here it is, it's Mudawama, uh, that he was regular and consistent in worshipping Allah. And he was Hanifa. Hanif here is uh, al mail uh, an al batil ila al haqq. That for someone to turn away from falsehood towards truth. And this is called, it's from al Hanaf. Al Hanaf. And the opposite of al Hanaf is al Janaf. And al Janaf is to go from truth to falsehood. Al Janaf is to lean towards falsehood away from the truth. And you're at the truth and you start to go towards the falsehood or you're in the middle and you start to lean towards the falsehood. This is called Al-Janaf. And Al-Hanaf, from which the name comes Hanif and Hanifa uh, and Hunafa uh, and Al-Hanifiya, the religion of Ibrahim, is to turn away from the falsehood to the truth. وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ And he was not from the mushrikeen. Now this is taken from the ayah. إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمْ إِبْرَاهِيمْ كَانَ أُمَّةً قَانِتًا لِلَّهِ حَنِيفًا وَلَمْ يَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ شَاكِرِينَ لِأَنْعُمِهِ Until the end of the ayat. That Ibrahim, so the ayah says Ibrahim was an ummah, obedient to Allah, hanifan, turning away from falsehood to the truth, and he was not from the polytheists. Ibn Mas'ud, he used to say Mu'adh is like that. Mu'adh is like Ibrahim. He's an ummah. He's obedient to Allah. He is regular in his obedience to Allah. He is Hanif. He turns towards the truth and or he leans towards the truth and he's not from the polytheists. Tashbihan lahu bi Ibrahim. He would compare him or he would say that he has resemblance to Ibrahim. He re Mu'adh resembles Ibrahim. That Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu resembles Ibrahim. And that's why I think if you take this whole context, the correct, either there is a ha, one ha too many in the text, and it should be, وَكَانَ يُشَبَّهُ Ibrahim, Or it should be, as is mentioned in some of the manuscripts, وَكَانُوا يُشَبِّهُونَهُ Ibrahim, Rather than attributing it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, before we now get into taqwa and what it is and 
I, now I'm going to ask my question. After all of that, we took six reasons why Mu'adh had a high position in the sight of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A high position in the sight of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why then did the Prophet Sallallahu did uh, why then did Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala bring this hadith rather than the other hadith of taqwa? Why this hadith specifically? Let's see what we have. Do we have some answers on YouTube for this? We'll take a couple of seconds for the video to reach you guys or for the and then for you to type some answers. So I will just give you a moment or two to think about it, inshallah. Mm -hmm. In that time, I will make sure that I didn't miss anything out from my notes. To highlight the importance of the person that we should learn from. That could be something, definitely. That's a good point. That this is the type, it's a very good point, that this is the type of person we should be learning from. Someone like Mu'adh ibn Jabir radiallahu anhu. It's a very good point. Hundred percent. That's exactly the answer I wanted. That if this advice was given to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, and Mu'adh is Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he is the most knowledgeable about the halal and the haram. He's going to be put ahead of the scholars by a stone's throw. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, "I certainly love you." Uh, he was behind the Prophet ﷺ on a donkey. The Prophet ﷺ sent him as a mufti and a judge to Yemen. Uh, he was compared to Ibrahim, and it said to him, "Ittaqillah." have taqwa of Allah, then everyone else is min babi awla. And it's, remember, who is Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah writing to? He's not writing to an ammi, to a regular, you know, kind of average Muslim. He is writing to a scholar. He's responding to a great scholar, somebody who has knowledge. And so he's saying to him, if this advice was given to the Imam of the Ulama, the leader of the Ulama, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, the, the, the scholar's Imam, then every scholar after Mu'adh needs this advice. And if it was given to Mu'adh and he had that level of Iman and that level of Taqwa that the Prophet loved him so much and gave him these huge responsibilities and gave him this particular special treatment, and that was the situation of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. Then we are even more in need of this advice. And it also tells you that you shouldn't be upset when people say to you, Ittaqillah, Ittaqillah, have taqwa of Allah. If, you know, so it, it said that it was, uh, it was said to Umar. Someone came to Umar when he was the Khalifa of the Muslims. When he was the Khalifa of the Muslims, they came to Umar, they said, Ya Umar, ittaqillah. O Umar, have taqwa of Allah. And Umar, he said, La khayrun o la khayra fikum idha lam taquluha. Aw kama qal. He said, there is no good in you if you don't say this to me. Wa la khayra fiya. And there is no good in me if I don't have this taqwa within me. It's not an insult. It's not like ittaqillah. It's a golden word of advice. So we shouldn't be taking it as an insult or as something bad. Ittaqillah. Rather, it is something that is praiseworthy and something that the people shouldn't shy away from. This advice that Allah Azza wa Jal gave. So looking at the time, we definitely need to speak about what this advice uh, is. So, uh, what I want to do is, is for you to read, insha'Allah ta'ala, uh, just read for me the, the next two lines. فعلم أنه أنها جامعة وهي كذلك لمن عقلها مع أنها تفسير وصية القرآنية أما بيان جمعها فلأن العبد عليه حقان 
and English. The Prophet ﷺ gave Mu'adh radiallahu anh this wasiyyah, knowing that he was the possessor of all these excellent qualities. This indicates that this wasiyyah is comprehensive, which is obvious to anyone who understands it. Furthermore, it's an explanation of the Qur'anic wasiyyah. Mm. Here, actually, there's a mistake in the translation here. It needs to be corrected. There's a mistake in the translation. What does it say after he gave him this wasiyyah? Knowing that he was the possessor of all these mm. That's not what it says. There's a mistake in the translation. The translation should say, فَعُلِمَ أَنَّهَا أَيْ أَنَّ الْوَصِيَّةَ جَامِعًا so not that Mu'adh has all of these qualities, but that the wasiyya is jami'a. فَعُلِمَ أَنَّ الْوَصِيَّةَ جامعة. Then it was known, so it's known that this wasiyya is comprehensive in nature. Because the Prophet ﷺ gave it when to Mu'adh? When he sent him to Yemen to be the judge and the da'iya and the mufti. When you're going like that by yourself, to be the one who's going to take the, the, the deputy position yani from the Prophet you're going to give fatawa on his behalf, you're going to give judgments on his behalf, you're going to teach the people, you're going to convey what he said, you're going to teach them the Qur'an and the hadith on his behalf, then for sure this advice has got to be jami'ah. It's the advice that's jami'ah and not mu'ad, that's jami'ah here. It's the advice that is jami'ah. فَعُلِمَ أَنَّهَا جَامِعَةً أي فَعُلِمَ أَنَّ الْوَصِيَّةَ جَامِعَةً This was said to Mu'adh when Mu'adh was sent to Yemen and that was in the 10th year after the Hijrah before Hajjatul Wada' before the farewell Hajj that Mu'adh was sent to Yemen. And Mu'adh remained in Yemen radiallahu anhu during the time of Abu Bakr and the Khilafah of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he came back in the time of Umar and he went on to Asham where he died in the Levant uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu wardah in the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. فَعُلِمَ أَنَّهَا جَامِعَةً So it was known that this wasiyah is jami'ah. This wasiya is jami'ah, it's comprehensive because the Prophet ﷺ was given jawami'ul kalim. The Prophet ﷺ said, Fuddiltu ala al anbiya bi sit. Hadith hadith of Abi Hurayrah radiallahu anhu. Fuddiltu ala al anbiya bi sit. I was given six things where I was preferred over all of the other Prophets. Six qualities or six things that I was given that I was preferred over all of the other Prophets. The first one, I was given comprehensive speech. It means I was given the words which are deep in meaning and small in number. Small sentences, small words, which are very, very deep and profound in meaning. Small words, which are deep and profound in meaning. The Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh, just a few words, Few small words. Those words could be turned into volumes because there were volumes of knowledge within them. And those words, in reality are actually the words that Mu'adh took and he made them the basis of everything he did in Yemen. In other words, everything he did, judging between people and uh, giving fatawa and uh, the issue of calling people to Islam and teaching them the Quran, the Hadith and so on, in all of these things, he turned back to these few words. So these few words are enough to make someone a judge and a da'iyah and you know, to prepare them for that role and a mufti to prepare them for that role for who? Like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah ta'ala he said liman aqalaha for the one who understands them because not everyone is given the, the knowledge to understand them many times we, we see this hadith ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt and we don't see what Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah saw from it 
and so on. And likewise, n none of us see what Mu'adh radiallahu an saw from it. So it shows you just how deep and how profound these few words the Prophet said, they were liman aqalaha, for the one who really understands them and really comprehends them. Ma'annaha tafsirul wasiyyatil Qur'aniya. While these words are the tafsir of the ayah in the Qur'an. So that's a second reason why Shaykh al-Islam al Taymiyyah chose the hadith of Mu'adh, because he's going to show us later on in the text that this these words of Mu'adh, they that were said to Mu'adh, the words of the Prophet said to Mu'adh, they are the wasiya Qur'aniya. They are the tafsir, tafsir al wasiyat al Qur'aniya. They're the tafsir of the ayah in the Qur'an that the Shaykh brought. And that's another reason. So he brought it to show that if it's said to Mu'adh, then all of us need it even more. And if it's said to Mu'adh, then the scholars need it as much as the general people need it. And likewise, that this hadith is the tafsir of the ayah as it will be explained. And now, أَمَّا بَيَّانُوا جَمْعِهَا فَلِأَنَّ الْعَبْدَ عَلَيْهِ حَقَّانِ So now, this wasiya is considered to be jami'ah. And now Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala is going to explain to us why it is jami'ah. Why it is a wasiya which is comprehensive. As for explaining its comprehensive nature, this is because there are two rights which the servant has upon them. They have to carry them out. Before that now, with this word jami'ah, we came to a nice place to talk about the word taqwa and the fact that the word taqwa is kalimatun jami'ah. It is a comprehensive word, a deep and comprehensive word. So first of all, this word taqwa, it comes from the Arabic wiqaya, which is a barrier or a shield. That's what the word comes from. And that's why it doesn't come from the word fear. You know when people talk about fear Allah, but the word taqwa doesn't come from the word fear. The word fear, al-khawf, al-khashiyah, uh, al-ru'b, uh, and other words like that for fear. But the word taqwa comes from wiqaya, which is a prevention, or a barrier, or a shield. And linguistically it means a ba to put a barrier, and taj'ala baynaka wa bayna ma takhafu wiqaya to put a barrier between you and something that you fear. To put a barrier between you and something that you fear. That's linguistically. So linguistically, if you were to break a glass and the glass smashes on the floor, the first thing you do is put your shoes on. Why do you put your shoes on? Wiqayatan. Wiqaya. I want a shield or a barrier or a protection against the glass from my foot. Akhafu, I fear this glass will stab me in the foot or cut my foot. And so I wish for a wiqaya, a barrier or a protection or a preventative barrier to stop me from getting this cut. Likewise, if you go for an x-ray, before they carry out the x-ray, the technician goes behind the lead screen, right? And they put you that lead, you know, lead uh, jacket on so that the, the, you only get the x-ray in the place that you want. Why? So as a wiqaya. To go behind the screen as a wiqaya. I want a protective barrier between me and the radiation that I'm scared of. This is filugha in the language. Now we have to ask, okay, what about the sharia? In the sharia, we're not scared about glass. And we're not scared about radiation. In the Sharia, we're not scared about the sun, so we put sunscreen on or put a hat on to shield us from the sun. In the Sharia, what are we scared of? We're scared of 
the punishment of Allah, his curse, his anger, and the hellfire. عَذَابُ اللَّهِ وَغَضَبُهُ وَلَعْنَتُهُ وَنَارُ We're scared of Allah's anger, we're scared of his curse, we're scared of his punishment, we're scared of the hellfire. This is what we are seeking a wiqaya for. A protective barrier to protect us from the fire. A protective barrier to protect us from the anger of Allah. To protect us from the la'na, the curse of Allah. And a la'na, it means uh, to be al-bu'd an rahmatillah, to be far away from Allah's mercy. We don't want to have these things happen to us. We want a protective barrier from the fire, the protective barrier from Allah's punishment, His curse, His anger. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, He said, have or seek protection from the fire or shield yourself from the fire, even if it is only half a date. Shield yourself from the fire even if it is only half a date. Shield yourself from the fire, even if it is only half a date. So this is what the word taqwa means. To put a barrier or a shield between you and between Allah's anger and his punishment, his curse and the hellfire. Now the question is, how do you do that? What is taqwa in reality then? Okay, we know what it is linguistically and we know what it is in a shara'i sense, but we're still in a linguistic shara'i sense. We're still in a, in a, in a, a ta'rif which is shara'i, which is lughawi shara'i, or which is istilahi, if you like. It is a, a technical explanation of the Islamic context, but it's still linguistic, it's still rooted in the language. It doesn't tell us the reality of it. What's the reality of taqwa? The reality of taqwa is best defined, and from those who praise this definition, is Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, ibn Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala, uh, and others who praise the, the definition of uh, the tabi'i, Talq ibn Habib uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. The Tabi'i, who came after the Sahaba, uh, عنهم, uh, Talq ibn Habib, from the generation after the Sahaba. And Shaykh al-Islam praised his definition and so did Ibn Rajab rahimahumullah ta'ala. He said that it is an ta'amala bi ta'atillah ala nurin min Allah رَجَاءَ ثَوَابِ اللَّهِ وَأَنْ تَتْوَكَ مَعَاصِ اللَّهِ عَلَى نُورٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ مَخَافَةَ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ Or in some wordings, الْعَمَلُ بِطَاعَةِ اللَّهِ عَلَى نُورٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ رَجَاءَ ثَوَابِ اللَّهِ وَتَرْكُ مَعَاصِ اللَّهِ عَلَى نُورٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ مَخَافَةَ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ It is to act in obedience to Allah. So the first part, Talq, he split it into two. The first part, he said, الْعَمَلُ بِطَاعَةِ اللَّهِ It is to act in obedience to Allah. Acting in obedience to Allah. عَلَى نُورٍ مِّنَ Allah Upon a light of guidance from Allah, i.e. with knowledge of, of the guidance given to you by Allah and by the Prophet wasallam. Not that a person is trying to obey Allah by their desires, by their feelings, this feels right to me, this seems right to me. But a person who is trying to obey Allah based upon knowledge, ala basira, upon insight and guidance and knowledge. Raja'a thawabillah. Hoping in Allah's reward. So here's the intention. And it's wrong those people who say we don't hope for Allah's reward. Some people say that, subhanAllah, nas'al Allah Azza wa Jal and yahdiyana wa iyyahum. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to guide us and them. 
that there are some people who say this, we're not after Allah's reward and we don't fear Allah's punishment. The Prophet وسلم, used to stand at night hoping for Allah's reward and fearing Allah's punishment. And you're not better than him. And therefore, as he and as the Prophets, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ they used to rush to do good deeds and they used to call upon us in hope and in fear. In hope and in fear. وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ And they were submissive towards us. The prophets had hope and fear. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had hope and fear. We said this advice was given to the Prophet وسلم, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّبِيُّ اتَّقِ اللَّهِ O Prophet, have taqwa of Allah. So from this we understood that the first half of taqwa is acting in obedience to Allah upon a light of guidance from Allah which is knowledge raja'a thawabillah hoping for Allah's reward wa tarku ma'asillah this is the second half leaving disobedience wa tarku ma'asillah leaving disobedience Ala nurim min Allah upon a light of guidance from Allah. Makhafata adabillah fearing Allah's punishment. So taqwa is made up of two things. It's made up of doing as much of what you have been commanded as possible, and leaving as much of what you have been prohibited as possible. So a person is doing what Allah commanded them and leaving what Allah prohibited them. Some may say, isn't it the case that taqwa is about leaving the haram, not doing the good deeds? Isn't taqwa about leaving haram more than doing good deeds? The answer to that is when the word taqwa comes along with the word bir, that's what it's there for. But when the word taqwa comes on its own, it's from those words إِذَا اجْتَمَعَ تَفَرَّقَ uh, That when these two words come together, they go apart. وَإِذَا تَفَرَّقَ اجْتَمَعَ And when they go apart, they come together. Meaning that if you find bir and taqwa in the same sentence, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Then bir is doing everything good. It's the first half of what Talq said. Al-amalu bi ta'atillah ala nurin min Allah, raja'a thawabillah, acting in obedience to Allah upon a light of guidance from Allah, hoping for Allah's reward. And taqwa is the second half. Talqu ma'asillah ala nurin min Allah, makhafata adabillah, leaving disobedience to Allah upon a light of guidance from Allah, fearing Allah's punishment. When the word taqwa is mentioned on its own, like the hadith of Mu'ad, ittaqillah, or the ayah, and ittaqullah, then it gathers the meaning of al-birr within it. So it has the meaning of al-birr within it. And the same for al-birr. When al-birr is mentioned on its own, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ Al-birr contains both doing that which is good, and keeping away from that which is evil. And this of course contains, as we said, the importance of knowledge and the importance of following the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the light of guidance from Allah. And it contains the importance of hoping in Allah's reward and fearing Allah's punishment. إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا وَكَانُوا لَنَا خَاشِعِينَ They used to rush to do good deeds and they used to call upon us in fear and hope and they used to be humbly submissive to us. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop there and we'll take questions because this uh, paragraph about the rights of Allah and the rights of His servants this will take us time to explain, and I don't want to rush it. Um, 
We are a little behind, which is normal for a first lesson because we had an introduction to the book. Uh, and so we are probably a little bit behind where we would like to be. But inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow we will catch up and we'll go a little more quickly because inshallah everyone is clear about what it is that we're talking about. And I think always when you begin a book, you should begin a little more slowly. Uh, and then when you go forward, you can speed up a little bit. And that just gives everybody a chance to adjust to the topic of the book. The wasiyya al wasiyya al sughra the lesser or the smaller wasiyya that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah gave, the wasiyya which is known as wasiyya Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, uh, wasiyya to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, li Abi al-Qasim al-Sibti, the wasiyya of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala to Abi al-Qasim al-Sibti, Abi al-Qasim al-Sibti. So now we're going to give 15 minutes, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, because of Maghrib time, we do have to finish promptly at 8 o'clock. We don't have the option to uh, extend 10 minutes or 20 minutes uh, because of Maghrib where I am in the UK. Uh, we have to uh, promptly finish at 8 o'clock, but we have 15 minutes to try to answer questions. If we could start with questions about the book so far, what we spoke about, or questions about what I said, clarifications, anything you think that I said that might have been incorrect or that needs some further clarification, we'd really appreciate it. And furthermore, then we can go on to the questions that maybe might be off topic, inshallah. Ustaz, I do not understand the point of if and taqwa being in the same sentence. Could you please explain that? Okay, yeah, absolutely. So the question says, uh, or the question I said, that I didn't understand bir and taqwa in the same sentence. So when bir and taqwa come together in the same sentence, bir takes half the meaning and taqwa takes the other half. So if we take the meaning of taqwa as being doing good and keeping away from evil, then it gets cut in half. The doing good belongs to al-bir, and the keeping away from evil belongs to al-taqwa. However, when those words are not together in the same sentence, they both cover both of them. So when the word bir is on its own, it covers doing good and keeping away from evil. When the word taqwa is on its own, it covers doing good and keeping away from evil. Uh, of course, the emphasis is different. With bir, the emphasis is righteousness. And with taqwa, the emphasis is protection from Allah's punishment. So it's not that they're, they're not the same word. It's not like bir and taqwa are the same. But they cover the same thing. Bir, which refers to righteousness, covers doing good and keeping away from wrong. And taqwa, being protected from punishment, covers doing good and keeping away from evil. But when those two words come together, now we have two words in the same sentence, which are both covering the same thing. It doesn't go like that. Now it gets cut in two. Bir refers to doing good and taqwa to keeping away from evil and bir with the emphasis on righteousness and taqwa with the emphasis on protection. So let me give an example. Allah said, ittaqullah. وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Have taqwa of Allah. Here, what does taqwa cover? It covers doing good and keeping away from evil. Allah said, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Cooperate in bir and taqwa. What does taqwa cover here? Just keeping away from bad. And bir covers doing good. So there are two words that when they come together in the same place, we split the meaning in half, we give the doing good to bir and the keeping away from evil to taqwa. But when they are found independently in their own sentences, each one covers the meaning of the other. Can I just ask if that made sense? We'll take another question, but can I just check with the person who asked the question that they said that uh, they gave you a feedback that that made sense to them? At the beginning you talked about seeking your own knowledge from kufar. Do you mean we shouldn't? In the beginning, we talked about seeking worldly knowledge from the kuffar. Do we mean that we shouldn't? I, I wouldn't say that we shouldn't. I, I don't think that that's necessarily an Islamic ruling. But I would say that we should be reluctant or it shouldn't be our first port of call. Sadly, it's the case when we talk about business, productivity, we talk about uh, medicine, we talk about you know, many other fields that we, our first port of call is the non-Muslim. 
those that Allah said about them, يَعْلَمُونَ ظَاهِرًا مِنَ الْحَيَاةِ الحياة الدُّنْيَا وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ In Surah Al-Rum, they know that which is apparent from the worldly life. But when it comes to the Akhirah, they are unaware. So I just think it's the wrong approach for us to be taking worldly knowledge from them as though they have been given this great, amazing thing. Rather, our approach should be to take the knowledge from Islam and from the Muslims and then where we find these people have some benefits that we can take, there is no harm in taking them. It doesn't hurt. The Prophet ﷺ said, Hadithu an Bani Israel wa la haraj. Report what Bani Israel said and there is no harm in it. But don't make this, there's a difference between reporting what Bani Israel said and going to learn your things from Bani Israel in the first place, ibtida'an. There's a difference, right? So there's a difference between someone who says, Islam says this, the ulama of Islam say this, there are Muslims who have benefited us with this, and some non-Muslims said this and this. Versus someone who says that non-Muslims say and non-Muslims do, and this is my methodology. Learn your deen and your dunya from Islam and from that which is with the Muslims. And when you find that there is a need to take some things from those non-Muslims, take it, don't worry about it. Wala haraj. Take it. In the worldly life, take it. But don't go to them first and don't sit at their feet. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, whoever says to the kafir, Sayyiduna, you are our Sayyid, you know, speaks to them respectfully, Sayyid, you're our Sayyid, you know, Sir, Master. He has brought the ghadab of Allah upon him, the anger of Allah upon him. How can a person, and I find, you know, worse than this, I mean, the most thing that shocks me is when people learn their religion from the kafir. And I'm sitting here not too far away from, from Durham University uh, where there is at least one or more non-Muslim lecturers who lecture Muslims about Islam. How are you going to sit and say, that is my ustad? How are, you've earned the anger of Allah Azza wa upon yourself to sit at that person's feet and say, this is my ustad, this is the ghadab of Allah upon the person who does this. You don't go to these people and sit at their feet and say, Sir and Sayyid and La Wallah. We go to the Muslims and we learn and whatever little things is left from the ulum al dunya, the worldly sciences that we didn't find from the Muslims, okay, we'll take it from these people. But we don't give them that izza, that respect and honor that we're going to sit at their feet and say, this is my ustad, hada shaykhi, this is my shaykh. Oh Allah, this is a wrong approach. Instead, these people, the Prophet I mean, he told us not to give them space on the road. Don't give them, don't even, don't allow them space even on the road. Put, put these people where they belong. Don't raise them up to this height of being your shaykh, your ustad, not even in ulum al-dunya. Rather, we take from Islam and from the Muslims, and where we don't find that knowledge, there is no haraj, no harm in taking from them, but we take it from them like that. We don't raise them up on a pedestal like that, that these people and all oh, these are like... You know, I've, I've read some books that non-Muslims recommend or that they've written. Some books about timekeeping, and how to be productive. Alhamdulillah, I benefited some things. But when I was reading them, I'm always thinking, where is this in Islam? What is Islam? Because Islam is my truth. Islam is the haqq. What this person wrote, it's... You know, mizaj, it's a, it's a mix up of this and that and the other. But I'm finding things in there, okay, value your time. Allah said, wal asr, inna al insana lafi khusr. So I already knew that from Islam. So I didn't need this non Muslim to tell me that time is the most valuable resource that we have because Allah told me, wal asr, inna al insana lafi khusr. I knew it already from Islam. And so on. But if you read the book and you find out, yeah, this is a point, yeah, this is mentioned in Islam, this is important to note. And you take some of it and you leave some of it, there is no harm in that. But don't make them your first port of call and don't raise those guys up on a pedestal where you put them to be these like these role models to be followed or people like mashayikh or ulama to be learnt from. Rather, if they didn't know that Allah Azza wa Jal wahtahu la sharika la deserves to be worshipped alone and with no partner, then what knowledge will you benefit from them after that? Because there is no knowledge to be benefited from if this person doesn't know 
that Allah wahdahu la sharika la deserves to be worshipped and no one deserves to be worshipped except him and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Yeah, okay, so it's a good question. What about university degrees? Again, I would say try to learn from the Muslims wherever you can. Try to, to, to make Islam your first port of call. But if you learn from them in you know th these sciences, then inshallah ta'ala, your, your concern is whether those degrees themselves have mahdhurat in them, haram in them. You know, like the way they're funded, uh, the way that you... Um, are in a mixed class with Muslims and non-Muslims and or you're in a mixed class with men and women or like this there can be some you know like some issues there but the idea that you could learn something in medicine from a non-Muslim the idea you could learn something in, in business from a non-Muslim it's not that it in itself is not a problem but don't make it your mentality that you go to them first and that they are your you know sheikh and ustad instead this person is just you know filling in for me whatever I have not yet understood from the Qur'an and the Sunnah knowing that that knowledge is inside of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and inside of the knowledge that the Muslims have passed on from the Qur'an and the Sunnah but maybe I don't quite have the knowledge to grasp that yet and I'm just gonna you know take a few little points here and there but everything they tell me I'm gonna run it through a filter of what Islam says because my deen and my dunya and the islah the rectification of my deen and my dunya are found in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, not in the degrees and the studies from the non-Muslims, and Allah knows best. I have a question regarding the qualities of Muhammad. Is it that he had those qualities or he, or he was taught those qualities? I didn't understand that part. It's a very good question. What Did Mu'ad have those qualities or was he taught those qualities? Uh, there is no doubt that knowledge comes with learning. As the Prophet wasallam, he said, Knowledge comes with learning and being forbearing and, and gentle with people comes with practicing it. So no doubt Mu'adh got that knowledge after the gift of Allah and the grace of Allah that he was given those qualities by Allah and gifted by Allah and Allah doesn't gift them to anyone. Isn't Allah the most knowing or the most knowledgeable of those who will be grateful. Allah knows best who will be grateful. So Allah gave certain things to Mu'ad. But then Mu'ad also took the asbab, the causes of learning, and he studied hard. And he spent time with the Prophet ﷺ, and he gave up his time to be around the Prophet ﷺ and to learn from him. And that's not easy, you know, like we all say, if it was the Prophet, I would do it. But wallah, you know, subhanAllah, there's a YouTube video a YouTube video and we don't find our time to watch it and that the reality is it's sad but it's how you know all of us and I'm, I'm speaking about myself not not anyone else that there are so many opportunities for knowledge and we say if it was the Prophet وسلم, I would go and learn if it was Mu'adh ibn Jabal I would go and learn from him if it was Abu Bakr and Umar I would attend their lecture if it was Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah I would be there I would give up my job and my work and I would study if it was Sheikh bin Baz rahimullah ta'ala, I would go and study. If it was until we get down to like anything other than the person in front of you, because the shaitan wants you to just delay and to avoid that effort that is needed. Abu Huraira used to spend his night, used to stay up all night revising hadith to the, prof the point that the Prophet ﷺ told him to pray witr before he went to sleep because he used to spend the night revising hadith. Allah didn't just put a memory of hadith in his mind like that. Yes, the Prophet made dua for him for, for, to, to have knowledge that is not forgotten. And that was a huge part of it. But he studied and revised and memorized every night. He used to divide his night into three. A third for revision, a third for prayer, and a third for sleep. And he used to praise witr before he slept out of a fear that he might not wake up because of how much time he spent studying. So you have to give knowledge your all and those qualities they came, they come about well hilm hilm is a quality of characteristic right it, it's like being forbearing uh, not taking revenge on people quickly uh, despite having the ability to do so those kind of qualities yes you are blessed by allah but also you have to work for them bit you have to try 
you don't naturally come out just really soft and gentle and kind and forgiving and letting things go. No, it's human nature. You want revenge. You get upset. You get angry. You get furious with someone. Hilm, softness and being forbearing, it comes with tahallum, with practicing it. So yes, Mu'ad was gifted those qualities by Allah Azza wa Jal. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua for him. But likewise, he also worked really, really hard to gain those qualities. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. I think we can take one last question. Uh, the, the question's finished or time finished? Time finished, okay. We take one more. Find, find me one more question. Because I said I would take one more and then I, I don't want to stop there. Okay, it's a very good question. Uh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a very good question. This word ruya, siratul tamrid, it indicates that the hadith might not be, not that it definitely isn't, but that it may not be. It may not be authentic. There may be something not quite right with it or something that requires further study. Um, it, it's indicated that there may be a weakness in it of some type. Does this apply to the hadith which are uh, sahih, is that how it is? Yeah. So, yes, in, in a way. Um, in general, in, in, the, in the sahih hadith, we don't find that, we find there's a chain of narration, we don't find these words like ruya. But one time we do find it is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari has some hadith that he narrates mu'allaqan. And that means he doesn't bring the chain, because this word ruya can only be used when there is no chain. If there's a chain, you can't say ruya, right? The chain itself is either weak or strong, but the chain is there. It's either a weak chain or a strong chain. This word ruya is said when there is no chain mentioned, you either are, are say, you're either mentioning a hadith without a chain and you're confident, or you're mentioning a hadith without a chain, you're not confident. So first of all, we have a hadith. Either the hadith is mentioned with a chain or without. If it's with a chain, the chain itself is enough for you. Like they say, whoever gives you the chain, that's enough. You don't need anything else. The chain will tell you authentic or not authentic. Someone didn't give you a chain. They, they bring a hadith mu'allaqan, without the chain. Aisha said, radiallahu anha. Mu'adh ibn Jabal said, it's narrated from Ibn Mas'ud. Here, when you don't bring the chain, there are two ways of saying it. Siratul jazm and Siratul Tamrid, a way in which you're indicating that you are confident in its authenticity. Bukhari says, Qalat Aisha. Aisha said. Now he doesn't bring the chain, but he says Aisha said. That means that Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, in this case, he didn't bring the chain because the hadith doesn't quite meet, match his standards, but he's confident that it's authentic. Qalat Aisha. But if he brings a sirah where it's not like a, a, a sentence where he's indicating to you that it's not so, it's reported, then here it, it indicates that it's not, uh, his confidence is not there. And it, this requires you to go outside and research the hadith, uh, that the confidence is not there, that it is absolutely authentic. So this is where you might find it in some of the Sahih collections, uh, like did Al-Bukhari mention it like an, like he, not Sirat al-Tamrid necessarily, not like Ruya, but just an, like Aisha, from, it's reported from Aisha. It's said that Aisha said. It's reported from Ibn Mas'ud. It's reported from so-and-so. So here, this it's reported, it means that he doesn't have that level of confidence. And if he says Aisha said, and Ibn Mas'ud said, and Abu Huraira said, then that means he has confidence, even though he didn't bring the chain. And you can find out more about this by looking into the ta'liq, 
of Imam al-Bukhari, that is the mu'allaqat or the mu'allaq hadith, the hadith mu'allaqah, the hadith which are mu'allaq, they are mentioned without chains in Sahih al-Bukhari, and the reason for them, and then whether Bukhari is confident in it, or whether he mentions it in a sigha with a way that he's not confident in it, and Allah Azza wa is best. Otherwise, generally in books of hadith, the chain of narration is what gives you the knowledge. That man asnadaka faqad ahalak. Whoever gives you a chain of narration, they've given you what you need. They've given you the reference now. Now you study the chain and find out is it authentic or not. That's what Allah Azza wa made easy for me to mention today. And inshaAllah ta'ala, tomorrow, same time, it's 5.30 p.m. UK time. If you're over in Dubai, it is 8.30 p.m. Dubai time. And I'm sure from the rest of the world, you can adjust the times accordingly. Inshallah, we'll be going on for the next seven days for myself, three days with Al-Wasid Sughra, four days with Kashf al-Shubahat, inshallah. And then uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan, inshallah ta'ala, is going to be taking you through two more books in the second week of this Dawrah, of this online seminar brought to you by al Madrasa al umariya that's what Allah made easy for me to mention, and Allah knows best whatever I said that is correct, and that is the grace of Allah Azza wa and His mercy. And whatever I said that was incorrect, then that is my own mistake, and Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, are free from that. That's what Allah made easy for me to mention, and Allah knows best. Wa salat wa salam, ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.